Good evening, everybody. Thank you. So all of you have on your tables, there are agendas there, so you can see what's happening tonight. First, you'll see that Dr. Steinger will, will, will be speaking, and then Dr. Samowitz, a urologist, will speak as well. The urologist will be speaking about urologic dysfunction. He's not here to talk to you about your cognitive skills. Okay, He's here to talk about maybe voiding problems that you have or anything else to do with the urologic system. For those that don't know, my name is Stuart Schlossman. I'm president and founder of MS Views and News. We started MS Views and News back in 2008 when we learned that there just wasn't enough information out there for people to find and where to find their information about multiple sclerosis. We started with a newsletter. That newsletter was just reaching the people in Miami at that time. It started to grow. Support group leaders around the state of Florida were asking for it so that way they could give it to their groups. And that began to grow. Around the country, they began asking for it. Now, these days, since the early 2000s, our newsletter is now reaching people in more than 90 countries. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Aside from that, we have over 28,000 that are now registered with us. By the way, before I go further with all the chutzpah about MS Views and News, we'll just say that um, I want to say thank you to Genzyme, a Santa Fe company who gave us the grant to do tonight's program. It's very, very important that we gratify those that give us the dollars to do our programs, because otherwise we would not have it to be able to supply these programs to all of you. In addition to Genzyme, I want to thank Infinity Clinical Research, QuestCore, Teva, as they also gave dollars to do tonight's program. Of course, I want to thank our volunteers. My nephew's here tonight. He's doing something with us for the first time. He just needs his community service hours, so he's here. <laughs> all right. Other than that, you know, I want to thank all of you. Again, these programs would be nothing if you guys didn't show up. So I thank all of you for coming. <laughs> all right, to go a step further, this is our eighth program of the year already. We're only at the end of February. We did three in January. We, this is our fifth program in February. Okay, we have plenty to do in March and all the way through June. When the second week of June comes to a close, we'll have done 18 programs so far this year. Last year as a whole, we only did 31 programs. Last year we did 30 in the state of Florida. We had one, our first one, outside the state of Florida. Some of you know about it, others don't. This year, as part of that 18, three of them will be out of the state of Florida. The first one will be in Birmingham, Alabama in April. Then we're doing Charlotte, North Carolina in May and back to Atlanta again in June. The second half of the year, we hope to be in South Carolina, other portions of Georgia, and many other locations in the state of Florida as well. Uh, done, now done with the education programs. April 6th, we're having our bowlathon. It's our fourth annual bowlathon. We would like you or your families to come on down. Why? Because the proceeds of this will benefit an MS stem cell research study. Okay? So we need people to come on down for this. It also benefit other MS education programs. Again, we ask you all, if you're able to come and bowl, great. If you can't bowl, but you could put the bowling ball down on top of a rail, it could scoot on down to the ground. Come with your family, come with your friends, just come on out and support the research that we are now supporting. If you wanna know more about that, stay after the program, speak with Jill, she's the person that checked you in outside. Again, tonight we're having Dr. Steingo and Dr. Samowitz. Each are gonna do their presentations. After their presentations, we're gonna do Q&A. So please hold off on any questions until afterwards. Now, just so you know, again, these video cameras are not here to record any of you. They're only here to see the presenters and possibly it'll pick up your voice. That's it. You will not be seen on the video. All right, so for anybody who's video shy or don't want the public to see them here, that's great. You won't be seen. So, though, if you have a question to ask, I'll be running around the room with a microphone. All right, and that's good for me because I need to lose a few pounds. All right, so just make sure that you have a lot of questions so I could lose maybe a pound and a half tonight. All right, that's it for right now. So again, I want to uh, thank you all for coming out and I want to thank Dr. Steingo to begin with. Let's get started, thank you. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Stuart. 
After that introduction, I have about 12 minutes left for my topic, but I'm accustomed to following Stuart. He gets longer and longer, I get less and less time. So, um, so for many of you that are, that are familiar faces, uh, this, this, I started out with this concept of the land of MS, these slides a few years ago. We've modified them over time. In the past year, it hasn't changed very much, but tonight's slides are tweaked a little bit from whatever you may have seen in the last uh, two or three months. Uh, we, we moved some of them around because the slides that were at the end, we were not having much time for, so we put those at the beginning. And despite, I think, what the agenda says, we're going to talk about some specific topics tonight. And then if we have to go, if we have time to go into some of the drugs and things like that, we can go into it. And that is because in the past year since Tecfidera was approved, there have been no new drug approvals. We did expect a new drug to be approved about a month ago. That was a drug called Lemtrada, but for some reason, the FDA decided not to approve it at this point. It's a very effective drug. It's approved even in Mexico. Imagine they have a drug in Mexico we don't have approved in this country. And it's approved in Europe, and it's approved in Canada, but it was the FDA, despite approving the study being done, did not approve the drug for some unknown reasons, a very effective drug that is for people with severe MS. Hopefully, we're going to have that in the future. So uh, let's see. Up is down, and down is up. This thing is a confusing thing. There we go. Down is up. Okay. So this is the land of MS. And what I meant by that is that when you talk about MS, when you see a neurologist, when you think about your condition, you don't just think about one thing. You have many different things you could think about, and they're all different. They overlap, but they're all different. Firstly, after the disease starts, we have to decide what, is, what type of MS do you have? How do we treat the disease? And we treat the first episode, and we treat your relapses, and we, then we have to address treating the disease using disease-modifying drugs. This is a whole topic in itself. And then we have to treat symptoms. And that's the symptom tower. And why do you think I call it the symptom tower? Because you all know that there are many symptoms of MS and many different problems that you could have. So we have to discuss each symptom. Is it the bladder? Is it the bowel? Is it pain? Is it numbness? Is it, is it weakness? Is it fatigue? Is it depression? What is the symptom we have to treat? And then I talked about medical support. And that's going to be following me tonight, like the urologist or the ophthalmologist, or the physical therapist, or the occupational therapist, and then most importantly, social support. I'm going to talk much more about that. And that's what this is part of, social support, going to support groups. This is a support group in a way, meeting people, and then self-help. And I'll put it in block letters because it's very important. So we could pick each one of those and talk. But what I wanted to do in the brief introduction, which some of you have seen before, is to show you what causes MS? And we don't really know what causes MS. But what happens in MS is that the central nervous system on the right-hand side here where the target is, I put a target there because in MS, the target is the brain and the spinal cord. That's the target. And what's the cause of MS? The problem with MS is over here somewhere. It's the immune system. So actually, MS is a disease of the immune system in which the target is the brain and the spinal cord. Just like Graves' disease is a disease of the immune system in which the target is the thyroid gland. And rheumatoid arthritis is a disease of the immune system in which the target is the joints. And Crohn's disease is a disease of the immune system in which the target is the gastrointestinal tract. So in MS, we're talking about a disease where the immune system goes wrong and decides to attack the brain and the spinal cord. And so you have abnormal white blood cells circulating called lymphocytes and they have to get into the brain or spinal cord. And in order to do that, they have to cross the blood-brain barrier. And is that important? Why did I put it there? Because what's where some medications work. Different medications work in different places. But Tysabri, for example, works right here at the blood-brain barrier. And then you have this lymphocyte. The immune system is, is, has gone wrong. And what triggered it off? This is what we need to find over time. We know of some triggers, and we need to find more triggers. There are some of them listed. Genetic factors this is a common question. You all may have this question. If I have MS, are my children more likely to get MS? And the answer is yes. You inherit susceptibility. So your children don't inherit MS. There's no guarantee they're going to get it, but they will be more susceptible to getting MS. So what you have in terms of MS is we, we kind of feel is that you have a genetically susceptible person, and then other factors will come into play and trigger the MS off. So there might be environmental factors. For example, where you live. We know that MS is more common in northern latitudes. So that could be a factor. How about sunshine and vitamin D? Vitamin D is very important for MS. So I'm going to spend a lot more time talking about that. 
and other environmental factors, infections, mono is the one infection we know about uh, as a trigger factor, smoking is a trigger factor. So if you have a genetically susceptible person, your sibling, your, your children that have a risk for MS and then they are low in vitamin D and they get mono and they smoke, now you have a setup for someone getting MS. So some of those are preventable. The smoking is preventable, the vitamin D is preventable, the mono might not be. But these are all factors that are involved. So now what you've had is you have this situation where you have the trigger and it stimulates the immune system and ultimately it's going to attack the nervous system. So the lymphocytes have white blood cells. We don't have to talk too much about those. Did everybody see that, what just happened there? Should I do that again? Did everybody see the arrow flying across? Yeah? I like the arrow. Let's do it again. <laughs> One more time, watch that arrow. So that's what happens. So th th you, you activate the disease, the immune system is activated and you attack the target. And that's what, this is essentially what happens in MS. And potentially different drugs could act in different places. Some act, as I said, uh, some will act here on the immune system, that's where most of them actually act now. And some of them are working at the blood-brain barrier to prevent these lymphocytes from crossing and attacking the nervous system. And ultimately, we would like to restore the nervous system to have drugs that restore the myelin or restore the damaged nerve cells. This is showing you how you, if you block the blood-brain barrier, then the arrow will not be able to cross. This is what Tysabri does. And actually, interferons also work at the blood-brain barrier. See? Tysabri. This is what Tysabri does. Stops the arrow from crossing. So that's the level where Tysabri works. So this is just summarizing what I just said that you have a trigger, the lymphocytes are activated, they cause inflammation, the inflammation attacks the brain and the spinal cord. Now you've got inflammation, the inflammation damages the myelin, is the first thing that's damaged. That is called demyelination, that's why MS has always been known as a demyelinating disease. Early on, if you stop the myelin damage, you might actually have some recovery early on. Now, as the disease progresses, you can have a loss of the axon. The axon is the nerve cell, the nerve fiber. If myelin is damaged, there can be some recovery. If the axon is damaged, there is no recovery. Once the axon is damaged, there is no recovery. And ultimately, that will lead to atrophy. So you've seen two important things over here that I will talk about. There's a question that's often asked of me at the end, and I'll, so I'll answer it now. Is that inflammation is early, and degeneration may be a little later. But when they have studied patients early on with early MS, their first attack, and so there have been some unfortunate people that have an attack of MS and something else happens to them. They have an automobile accident or some other condition and people have died with after, soon after a first episode and they've looked at their brain and even early on they have already seen there may be a little bit of degeneration early on. But as the disease progresses, when someone has a more progressive type of MS, secondary progressive or primary progressive, then we see more of the degeneration and in relapsing remitting and early MS we see more of the inflammation. This is some of the differences between relapsing remitting and progressive type of MS. That's why we want to treat as early as we can up in that stage. This is just to highlight for you so you can picture your mind what happens when there's inflammation. So if you look in this picture over here in the top right and the top left over here, top right and top left, that's what normal brain tissue looks like. Now around the blood vessel, this is a, over here around this vein, look at this, you see millions of lymphocytes. That's what inflammation does. We said that in MS, the blood-brain barrier is broken. Here is the blood vessel, here is the brain. The barrier has been broken, and the inflammation is massive around this vein. That's what happens in MS. That's how it starts. Inflammation around the veins, spreading out into the brain. But this is what inflammation looks like. Normal brain, inflamed brain. So I wanted to talk to you about that initially, just to tell you what MS is. And now we've switched gears tonight. I spoke to Stuart. We've gone trying to respond to some comments that people have had. Oftentimes at this stage I go and we start talking about the MS medications, the disease modifying drugs and that aspect. But tonight what we're going to start with is self-help. We've spoken several times about the disease modifying drugs and we can certainly talk more about them if you want to. As I said, since Tech Federa was approved one year ago, there are no new drugs. And in the treatment, in, initially in the land of MS, we spoke about, I showed you that one building in the land of MS is self-help, because self-help is extremely important. And this is the acronym that I put together about things that you do that are most important. 
And the patient that has MS is the most important person on this team. Because if they don't participate in the team, then nothing else can happen. Everything else will fall apart. And so you can see this over here. It actually should be, I've changed, instead of team of friends, it could be teams, teams, I added the S there, friends. And I'll talk some in more detail about each of these as we go along. And so the first thing is, these are things you can do yourself. And they're not in any particular order of importance. And the importance is different in different people. The only reason they're in this order is because that's the, that's the acronym that I came up with. If, you've, if you could make any different acronym, I'd be happy to have a look at it and, 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 and change this over here. But this was the acronym I came up with. So the first thing that, that we know about with MS, of course, is temperature is important. And we know that people with MS are heat sensitive. So everyone knows if you have, go into a hot tub or you go into a hot shower, then you will feel weaker. That is because heat can slow down conduction in a nerve pathway. So you need to do things to keep your temperature down. Temperature won't make you actually have a relapse. It'll just increase the symptoms that you already have. It's most commonly seen with optic neuritis. Someone has had optic neuritis, goes out, it's too hot, they get blurry vision. They're not having a relapse. When they cool off again, it will be better. So if you're outdoors and you need to be outdoors, get a cooling vest. Or if you're exercising, it's one of the big problems. People start to exercise, they get overheated, they stop. They never start it up again. They're saying exercise is too much. Reduce it, reduce your exercise, keep yourself cool, keep the air conditioning going, get a cooling vest. What about cold? Are people with MS cold sensitive? Yes, cold can also be a problem. So cold and cold areas and cold temperatures, the first problem about cold is that cold increases muscle stiffness. So everybody knows when it's very cold, you feel stiff, your muscles tighten up. So cold can also be a problem. So all temperature fluctuations and extremes can be problems for people with MS and they need to manage all temperature fluctuations. Expectations. Expectations is very important. This goes well when we follow uh, talking about the drugs, but the reason why this is very important is because it's very, when you take these medications, all the medications that we have for MS, remember there are now 10, 10 drugs approved for treatment of MS. The first drug approved for treatment of MS was May 1993. So it's only all, just 20, 21 years ago we had a medication. Before that we had no FDA approved drugs for MS. Now we have 10. And why expectations are important is because none of these drugs are a cure. But they are all to modify the course of the disease. And I see people periodically will come and see me six months after starting a drug and they would say, for example, the, I, I, the drug is not working. And I'll say, how do you know within six months your drug's not working? And they'll say, I feel no better. So remember the purpose, the expectations that you have for this medication are very important. When we start a new drug, the expectation that I have is that your disease stops progressing. Hopefully you will stop relapses and will stop progression. And then how do you get better? What else do you do to get better? Everything else that we talked about in the land of MS. So this drug stops the disease from progressing, slows the relapses, and then you do all these other things and we treat your symptoms and hopefully with that combination of things we start to make you feel better and improve the quality of your life. So expectations and adherence. Taking the medication. So let's, let's get some guesses over here. They did a study in Ottawa. That's in Canada. In Canada the people there are a captive group just like we will be probably soon. The, com the, the government knows every drug they take, whenever they get it, what they're having for breakfast probably. The government knows everything about them. So what percent, what's the compliance, do you think? What's the drop-off rate in medication use? Anybody have an idea? In the Ottawa study, within about two years, only about 50% of people were taking the drug as prescribed. 50%. So 50% of people are not taking the medication. You can't say, I'm not feeling well, I'm not doing well, if you're not taking the medication. Some people stop for a variety of reasons. Uh, we can even discuss some of those, but they stopped for a variety of reasons because one of them was they thought the medication wasn't working. If they had side effects, hopefully we encourage you to talk about them uh, so we can do something about it. So adherence is very important. There was a recent study published in which they, in which they stated that the compliance rate was about 75% with the injectable medications. And so people have said, well, you know, now guess what? I can take a pill now. So I'm not going to take injection, I'm going to take a pill. Do you know what the compliance rate for the pill was? 71%. Less than the injectables. So people forget their pill. Especially if it's a pill that's twice a day, they might forget their medication. 
or they feel good sometimes and say, you know what, I feel good, I don't need it today. And so the compliance has not been as good as it should be. And if you don't take the medication that's prescribed, it might not be as effective as we intend it to be. Mental aspects, memory, cognitive problems, stress. So these could be a topic on their own. And sometimes, as you know, Stuart has had a psychologist speak, but each one of these is very important. How to deal with stress. Stress is a, is a bad insult to the immune system. If someone is under stress, it could be physical stress, it could be financial stress, it could be domestic stress, all kinds of stress uh, can aggravate the immune system. The immune system is very sensitive to stress, so it's important to learn to deal with stress in whatever way that someone can deal with it. And then cognitive problems and memory problems. Memory problems are disabling. They're not often recognized. And if you talk to someone for a time, you might not recognize a memory problem. A physical problem is obvious. If someone doesn't walk properly, you can see that they have a physical problem. But if someone has a memory problem, it's not always evident. And if you look at young people that are disabled by MS, guess what the biggest cause of disability in young people is who are disabled from work? It's not, it's not, it's not physical problems. It's mental problems. It's memory problems. So memory problems, there are no good medications for memory problems, mental exercise, things like that have to be emphasized. And then I put up over here sleep. We'll talk a little bit more about sleep. But sleep is a big problem. And now if you start looking at these things, as we go down, you'll see how they start to interact with each other. So if you don't sleep, then what happens the next day? The next day you're fatigued. You might feel weaker. So each of these things start to interact. Outlook, attitude, uh, very important. Your outlook, a positive outlook is always obviously, and this has been shown for all autoimmune diseases, for cancer as well, a positive outlook. Trying to be positive if you can be. I understand, we all know that sometimes things are not positive, they're hard to deal with, but there's no doubt that people that have a positive outlook have a better outcome than if you don't. And then food, and we're gonna talk some more about diet and nutrition. We'll go into that. Relationships, so that means family, friends, support groups, all these things are very important. And we'll talk about these all a little more. Interactions, relationships, interactions, what we're doing here, uh, exercise. Can't stress enough how important exercise is. And if, you have, if the exercise makes you, overheats you and you feel weak afterwards, do less exercise, but don't stop doing the exercise. And then keeping up with news, so you know if your treatment is relevant. What's what all of you are doing that are here tonight, trying to keep up, find out about the news, what you've read about, is it true, is it accurate? There's a lot of false information out there as well, or information that gives you false hope. I put vitamin D on its own, and I put it separately over here from food because vitamin D is so important. And then smoking, because there are multiple studies published in the past year about how important it is to stop smoking just for MS and the immune system. And you'll see as we go along that there's another S that I could add here to smoking, and that's gonna be salt. So if there is salt on the table, we should remove it. Did anybody add salt tonight? You just lost three brain cells, but <laughs> salt is So I'm gonna talk about nutrition for a little while. I call this defensive nutrition eating healthy, things that are fairly obvious, such as eating breakfast. So what does your brain need to operate? Your brain needs some glucose, it needs protein, yeah, it needs a healthy breakfast, you need some breakfast. Now there are some people, who you probably have read about a diet called a, a ketone diet or a ketotic diet where people talk about fasting. It's a fasting diet. If you fast, your body makes something called ketones. And some people have suggested that if you have a day or so of fasting, like if you fast for one full day, maybe just drink water and fast for a day or so, occasionally it's not bad to cleanse the system. But generally it's good to have breakfast and not to skip meals. So most people feel that it's good to have several small meals a day rather, rather than multiple big meals. Um, so that's what you're doing by avoiding the lows, not skipping any meals. And then there's, there are many books written about diet. And I don't know, have any of you here seen Dr. Perlmutter? Anybody here know Dr. Perlmutter? Nobody? Dr. Perlmutter is a neurologist in Naples who's just recently published a book and it's called 
Green Brain. I think it's, now, it's somewhere in the New York Times bestseller list. And he's been on Oprah, and, he's, and, he's, and he speaks with Dr. Oz sometimes in that program. And he's a little extreme. And he is one who publishes a gluten-free diet. So in this book, Grain Brain, it's all about gluten-free diet. And if he was here catering tonight, there would be no bread, and no pasta, and no, none of these croutons, and there would be none of that kind of stuff at all. And he says we should be grain-free. If you go back to the original Dr. Swank diet, for those of you who remember Dr. Swank's diet, Dr. Swank said we should avoid fat, and we should avoid saturated fat. Uh, and I like that. He said avoid saturated fat, or have a low amount of saturated fat. So I think everything in moderation is good. Maybe it's hard to do an extreme diet. Dr. Perlmutter makes some very good points in his book about being gluten-free, but I think it's extreme, because he gives multiple quotes of patients who visited him, and, he they, and, and all of them do great on a gluten-free diet. So if they have MS, they do great. If they have Alzheimer's, they do great. If they have autism, they do great. Whatever they have, they do great in this grain-free diet. So I mean, this is too much for me. These diseases are all different. When something is alleged to cure every disease, I kind of get skeptical that it cures any of them at all. So maybe in moderation, maybe we do have too much grains. But if you have some, some, uh, some carbohydrates, maybe not refined carbohydrates, complex carbohydrates, in moderation, I think are fine. And with fats, if, you have, if your diet is mostly saturated fats, that's no good. So you have to have mostly unsaturated fats, as you find in fatty fish, salmon and things like that, or as you find in some nuts. Al almonds and some nuts are, are good as a snack in moderation. And then maybe more fiber and more plants. Looking at fiber, is the gastrointestinal tract important in MS? Yes. Why? Yeah, I mean, some people say you are what you eat. But the gastrointestinal tract is a very large organ where you put everything in your body, except you, you, you're wearing clothes. Most of your skin's covered. That's another very large organ in your body. But the gastrointestinal tract, so they have done studies now. There are studies published, and you can look these up on the internet in the following way, where they have looked at the bacteria in the gut. So our gut is rife with billions of bacteria. And now the food you eat changes the bacteria in your gut. And so what some studies have shown recently is that if you have meat and dairy products, animal products, this changes the bacteria in your gut, maybe in an unfavorable way. This is what recent studies have shown, that meat and bacteria and the gut, unfavorable, and that meat and bacteria and the gut is unfavorable for MS. So maybe meat is a toxin. I've always thought it is, but maybe the study actually is now showing that meat so again, if you have meat once a month, I don't think it's a bad thing, but I don't know about more. I don't know about frequent meat and dairy products. I think definitely do those things in moderation. Meat and bacteria in the gut is the link if you want to go on the internet and read about it. Meat and bacteria in the gut and MS. And obviously plants are, a, are a very healthy, especially vegetables. You can have some fruits. Dr. Perlmutter that I just quoted said don't have too much fruits because a lot of carbohydrates, but I think everything in moderation. Keep yourself hydrated. You know the importance of hydration. And then we talk about supplements, and if you go on the internet, you can find a thousand supplements. Now, I don't know that there's evidence for a, th evidence for a thousand supplements, but certainly you know, vitamin D is a very important one. Maybe B12, those are certainly important. And there are some others that are antioxidants that maybe are okay, but be careful with the supplement. Make sure you read what it says. If it says this supplement, whatever it is, supplement X, stimulates your immune system, you want to stay away from that. You don't want to stimulate the immune system. Your immune system is overactive enough. Remember right at the beginning, you remember the arrow flying over there? Well, if you keep stimulating the immune system, you're having arrows flying all over the place. Because they, but when you stimulate the immune system, it's not selective. You don't just stimulate one, one cell, you stimulate them all, maybe. So stay away from anything that says stimulates the immune system. And so defensive dining is the follow-up from defensive nutrition. So if you're saying, I'm eating healthy food, I'm eating a plant-based diet, mostly with fruits and vegetables. I'm eating healthy stuff. Does that mean you can eat anything you want? Have you seen an overweight vegetarian? Sure you have. You can eat too much of anything, even a good thing. You can have too much of a good thing too. Or you can take a good thing and, and cook it the wrong way. So it's very important to have calorie control as well. So not only should you control the content of what you eat, but also the amount of calories that you eat. And sharing portions is a good thing. Who should you share with? Who should you share? There you go. That's the answer. Yourself. 
That's the first person to share with. So when I started, when I read, had read all these things and started doing over this, the first thing that, that really was impressive to me was my wife and I had just been on a trip to Italy. And we ordered some pasta and, and, and I kind of looked at it and I said, where's the, where's the meal? It was like, you know, half, a third of a plate. There was not much food on the plate at all. And I thought, you know, that's, really, that's all we need. If you sit and you dine and you want to drink a little bit of wine and you eat slowly and you eat the pasta, by the time if you do it slowly, well, then, you, you know, you get full. If you eat too quickly, you can eat the whole big plate and guess what? You've got 500 more calories. So what you need to do is you need to share with yourself. You, get a, you go and eat this big plate, divide it in half. Immediately, when you get there, get the plate, divide it in half and ask them to bring you a box. Say, bring me a box, I'm taking this home. And take the rest home. Now you've got two meals, and only, you only need half of it. And why do we only need to, why, why is it better if we eat slowly? So we've been told this our whole life. I'm sure going back many years, my grandmother probably told me, eat slowly, you eat too fast. And probably the whole thing's gone full circle. Now I'm telling my grandkids, you eat too fast. And I eat faster than them probably, but you know, why do you need to eat? The food goes into your stomach, as it goes in, your brain gets a signal. If you stuff more and more, the signals haven't got to your brain, your brain will, will let you eat more and more. But if you eat slowly, then the signals are starting to go to your brain before you put more in. Now your brain says, you know, that's enough. So the slower you eat, the less you'll need to eat. Your brain will get the signal and it'll, shut, and it'll send you a signal, that's enough. So if you can, eat slower. So the portions you eat, and the speed you eat are important to do. Um, do not starve to eat out, obvious. Salad dressing on the side, look at your salad dressing. Look at it, and what I mean is look at the bottle and say, how many calories does this have? So try and go for low calorie dressings. You wanna add, you can use, the salad dressing can sometimes add as much calories as the whole meal can add. So look at the calories. If people have MS and they can't exercise, guess what happens to their weight? Most people gain weight and it's hard to lose, very hard to lose weight. If you're walking, and you're walking, and you're having some difficulty walking, and you put on 25 pounds, or 50 pounds, do you think it makes your walking worse? Does it give you more risk for having metabolic syndrome and metabolic disease? Now you add other diseases already. Now you start to bring in diabetes and heart disease, high blood pressure, other things. And alcohol has calories, so if you're gonna have some wine, moderation, a glass, two glasses, most. And how about beer every night? I saw somebody today and I said, are you drinking lately? Because he used to, and he said, no, not as much as before. I said, how much? He said, my six pack. That's it, just a six pack. Salt, sugar, and saturated fats. These are the bad S's. Salt we're gonna talk about. Sugar, you all have heard that sugar is a poison. And it's better to have sweetener any time of the day than sugar. Maybe you try not to have sweetener if you don't need it. But to my mind, I think having some Splendor or some Stevia or some other sweetener is far better than having sugar. And there's multiple books on sugar. Sugar to my, is, 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 is a poison. And then saturated fats, we spoke about that. Avoid the saturated fats, go for unsaturated fats. The plants, which plants? So at the bottom there you'll see I quoted Joel Furman. And I hope many of you have seen Joel Furman's specials on PBS, he's got multiple books as well but he also has specials on PBS, and they're great. And he talks about these different things over here that you could do, and you could eat colored vegetables, all colors, broccoli, kale, spinach, avocado. These are the ones he likes. He calls it combs, C, the colored vegetables, onions, mushrooms, berries, seeds, all of these are very good, quinoa, all these different things, you can look up all kinds of great recipes for them. You know, when you first look at them, they might be difficult to deal with, but there's a lot of stuff you can do. You go to YouTube. YouTube is where you find all the recipes for all these odd vegetables that you might never think you want to do in the past, but look at them, they have nutritional value. Quinoa is a good source of protein. Chickpeas, I mean, there are so many vegetables and plants out there that, you, that people are, are not creative with, because they stick with all the things that we've been using for the last 100 years, and they're much healthier for you and you can change your diet. And you can change it in 10 minutes, it's hard to do that. I do have one patient who changed his diet in, in overnight. And the way he did it was by watching a movie. Have, you, have any of you seen the movie Forks Over Knives? Forks Over Knives? Yes, some more Forks Over Knives? 
and it tells you about the destruction, the way we destroy the animals and, uh, and the farming industry in order to eat meat and poultry and stuff like that. This particular uh, patient was a, is a, actually a cardiologist and he came to see me and he said, I've become a, I've become a vegan. Uh, I said, how do you decide that? Overnight. And he watched the movie Forks Over Knives and told me he became a vegan. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. I think it's a great diet. And then I've seen him once since then. Six months later, he came and he said he was still a vegan. And he feels very good for it and very healthy. And you don't have to be extreme and become a vegan, but you can modify the diet in some ways. And so let's talk about vitamin D now, which I said is the most important vitamin probably for the immune system. And vitamin D, how does it work? We're not exactly sure. But we know you get more vitamin D than you do up when you're up in Minnesota or in Chicago where it's five degrees today. You're likely to get more vitamin D over here than over there. Now, we don't know exactly how it works. In your body, on the surface of cells in the body, there are receptors. Cells in your body have a thousand receptors for a thousand different hormones and vitamins and things like that. And vitamin D is very important to allow antioxidants to get into the cell. You all know about antioxidants. Most people probably take too many antioxidants and spend a lot of unnecessary money on too many antioxidants. But we do know that in autoimmune diseases and in MS, there is oxidative damage to the cell. And you want to take antioxidants to prevent that. And if your vitamin D level is low, they might not be able to get into the cell. So the purpose of vitamin D is to saturate the vitamin D receptors. And you'll see the normal range is 30 to 100. And the range we like for vitamin D for MS is about 75. We like it to be high because that saturates the receptors. If your vitamin D level is too low, you won't saturate the receptors. If you have a level of 45, it's not accomplishing the purpose. So if you go to your family doctor, and I see this frequently, someone goes to their primary care doctor, they come back, their vitamin D level is 45, they're told you're great. You're great maybe for general, but for MS, we want the vitamin D level to be high. High doses, vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. It can store in your fat if it's too high. It can store in the fat and you can become toxic. But we can measure it, so we know when you're toxic. It's very rare, I think I've seen, seen that once. Uh, it's very rare to have toxicity, but we can measure your levels, so. Kind of just a summary again of it. So we want a vegetable and fruit-based diet. And all your meals, salads, healthy vegetables, vitamin D. What about B12? So B12 is important for the nervous system in general. It's not specifically important for MS, but it's important for the nervous system. If you have B12 deficiency, the nervous system does not function as efficiently, and the other thing it will do is cause anemia. So you need to make sure, especially if you're doing a predominantly vegetarian diet like I've been emphasizing, to take, check your B12. So when I check the D, I'll often check the B12. A lot of people come in and say they want B12, it gives them energy. It's an energy boost. It helps with fatigue. Yes, does that happen? No, it's mostly a placebo effect. Why? Unless you're deficient in B12. So if you're deficient in B12, then supplementing B12 is, makes good sense. But, many, but the B12 in the body is a, fat, is a water soluble vitamin and your body has, stores up the, B, the, the B12 very well and we should check your level and if your level is normal, if your B12 level is normal, you don't need to take extra B12. It's not gonna do anything more. If your B12 level, if the storage in the liver is very high, you don't need more B12. Uh, we talked about replacing saturated fat with unsaturated fat, such as omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-3, not omega-6. So it's important to do omega-3 fatty acids. Fiber to keep your gastrointestinal tract regulated. We spoke about the GI tract, how important it is for immune diseases, and calorie control and sugar and all those things. At the bottom, I put some references. If any of you want to look at that, I'll leave that up for a second over there. The Blue Zone is a book, uh, and some of you have heard me talk about it before. Uh, so for those who haven't, though, I'll mention The Blue Zone. It is a book which was commissioned by National Geographic, and the author of the book was asked to go and look at certain areas in the world where people live a long time. He said, why do they live a long time? Let's go and study these four areas. And one of the areas was in Japan, one was in Loma Linda, California, the Seventh-day Adventist, one was in Costa Rica, and one was in Italy. And he looked at this and he said, why do they live a long time? And one of the things that they did was they had a predominantly vegetarian-based diet. Not because they wanted to be vegetarians, because they didn't like to eat animals or anything like that, because they couldn't afford to do anything else. They could not afford meat products and things like that. So that's why they, and they could grow vegetables. So that's why they did that, because of that reason. The second thing they did was they exercised. So these were people oftentimes that he looked at who were 80, 90 years old, and they were still exercising. What kind of exercise? They didn't go to the gym. 
There's no gym in the hills of Bellagio in Italy. There's no gym. They didn't go to a gym. They walked. There's no bus. There's no transportation. They walked miles. They had to take the sheep out. They walked miles. So exercise was a necessity. And the third thing that they did was they had a sense of purpose. They were still part of a community. They weren't an old person that was put aside in a nursing home somewhere or neglected by their family. Uh, and you know, they were, had a sense of purpose in life. Three very important things is what he came to the conclusion. Not like our society, unfortunately, where oftentimes older, older relatives and people are pushed aside, family members run off to some other city or county, and, 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 and I mean, it's just, it's, it's really sad when you see that happen. In Italy, it's a much more, the family tends to take more care of it, of their family. Um, Joel Furman, I talked about the Swank diet was the original MS diet, and then we talked briefly about the gluten-free gluten -free diet. And here is salt. Don't add salt. So sodium intake correlated posit positively. So let's go back for a second to vitamin D. They've done a study where they said that high vitamin D, high vitamin D, less MS activity. Now I'm going to say the opposite for salt. High salt intake, more MS activity. So they did the study, it was published recently, I put the author over there, that they actually measured people's dietary salt intake. And more needs to be done and more studies, but salt is bad. And the higher that the dietary salt intake was, the greater the relapse rate was and the greater the MRI changes were. This is something you need to actively modify in your diet. Salt. Don't cook with salt. If somebody cooks for you, tell them not to add salt. If you have to eat, don't add the salt. Put it away. So there's some things you can do as well. Importance of that. This is an illusion. I thought this was a cool plate over here. Is that you can see the portions on these two plates are identical. They're identical. But the one on the right side looks smaller because you've got a bigger plate. So people could eat more because they think they're eating less. Give them a big plate with the same amount of food and the illusion is that they look at this, I don't have much food, I'm gonna eat this whole portion. This is, here's another illusion I'll show you. Look at this over here. The amount of popcorn over here and over here are identical. But you can see this box over here, look, look at the difference in, it's only increased, this is increased in that dimension, this one is equal. So again, you get an illusion and you eat more. So the packaging, this is what the food industry does. They package things in ways that we might think, you know, we're eating the same amount or not eating that much. Meanwhile, the way they package it, we eat more. If you go back to here, you might, you might, you, you go and you, you're at a buffet or something like that. You're going to put more food on this big plate. Say, so, wow, there's not, there's not much over here. You got the same as that. If you had a smaller plate, you might eat less. So you get the illusion and you eat the wrong amount. So that was the first aspect of self-help I want to talk about nutrition. And um, as I said, in the past that's always been my last topic, but I wanted to emphasize that a little bit tonight. I hope, I hope you get some pointers. I think it's something very important that you do for yourself. Essentially, if you're taking your disease-modifying drug and hopefully it's working for you, then you need to do everything else around you to make your health better. And this is one of the things, is the way you eat, what you put in your body. And if your disease-modifying drug is not working for you, then what do we need to do after that? Then you need to talk to us. We have 10 approved drugs, and we can, I'm not going to have time to go through that tonight, but you have all of those. And then let's talk about the management of fatigue. I'm just going to summarize this, because Stuart says I have five and a half minutes to go. So fatigue, when you... Nothing? I'm done? Nothing? Fatigue. Remember when you have fatigue, when you come and see your neurologist or your doctor with fatigue and they say, here's Provigil, and you miss the whole boat. Okay? Firstly, fatigue has two big overall causes of fatigue. The first type of fatigue is what we call MS fatigue. It's the fatigue that somebody with MS has that somebody else's fatigue doesn't have. I wake up in the morning and I'm tired. Why? I've got MS. It's the primary fatigue of MS that is difficult to explain and that we have to fight with insurance companies about all the time. But we can't just say you have primary fatigue of MS, we have to look for other causes. But remember that the primary fatigue of MS is not laziness or a lack of motivation or psychological. This is commonly what I see. I see someone sitting in front of me and there's a spouse next to them who says, they would be fine if they just weren't so lazy. If they just you know, did something for themselves. Laziness. You are lazy. So all of you who are fatigued or not really fatigued, you're just lazy. 
or you lack motivation, or it's psychological, don't see a psychiatrist. There is a thing of primary MS fatigue that is important to understand. Insurance companies don't want to, but it is important. And then you have, most importantly, secondary MS fatigue. So for me, just to say you've got MS fatigue, I'm missing the boat. I have to say, what's the cause of your fatigue? Are you not sleeping well? Do you have pain? Do you have a bladder problem? Are you waking up? Do you go to the bathroom five times at night? So there are many other things that can contribute over here to secondary MS fatigue listed over there, and we need to address those. If you're fatigued because you're waking up five times a night to go to the bathroom or you have pain and I give you ProVigil, we've missed the boat. We haven't addressed the primary cause of your fatigue, so we need to do that. There are some medications for fatigue. We won't go into detail about that. I think I, seeing Stuart says, I know I have three and a half minutes to go. I will talk about sleep and MS just briefly. And there was a recent study, this is within the last, couple, last month actually, published on sleep and MS. And OSA there stands for obstructive sleep apnea. So now, one fifth of patients, 20% of patients in the study, 20% of MS patients actually had obstructive sleep apnea. It's a large number. And even more than that, a greater number, up to 50% of patients with MS had risk factors for sleep apnea. And if you have sleep apnea, guess what? You don't sleep, you're more fatigued. You have other things, you have cognitive problems. You can't think, you're foggy. You sleep. I had, a, I had a patient just today who told me the following things. She came with her husband and he said she fell asleep at the wheel. That's, that's scary, except the car was stopped fortunately, but she fell asleep at the wheel. Then she told me that she was visiting a relative in Tampa and she fell off the toilet because she fell asleep on the toilet and she fell off the toilet. She didn't hurt herself, fortunately, but she did. And so we went through some of these things. At the bottom here, this is a questionnaire. It's called the Stop Bang Questionnaire. But you can look at some of these things. If you have these things, you should do a sleep study. If you're snoring and very tired the next day, we should do a sleep study. If somebody's actually seen you have apnea or you have blood pressure problems, if your metabolic index is high, if you're a little older, if you have a large neck circumference, especially in a male, but in females too, if you have some of these risk factors, then you could have be having a problem with sleep and all these things, as I said before, interact. We can't separate one from the other. Sleep, bladder problems, fatigue, cognitive issues, walking, balance. You can't separate these things. We have to look at them as one, one picture. And we have to work on each of them at the same time and exercise. So briefly, how important is exercise? It's very important. Physical exercise is crucial, and everybody, almost everybody can exercise. And you can exercise if you can't walk. There are exercises for wheelchair-bound people. You can get them on the internet, there's booklets for them. And physical exercise is also important, because I put here you could also need to do mental exercise for your memory. But physical exercise also helps your cognitive function. But for exercise to exceed, you have to have these things over here. You have to be motivated. You have to want to do the exercise, you have to enjoy it, it has to be affordable, it has to be comfortable, it has to be cool. And these are the exercises you do, balance, endurance, stretching and strengthening. And these are what I call, finally, this is the final one I'll do at this point, what I call the pillars of, of, of MS support. What are pillars? When you think of a pillar, I don't know what you're thinking of, I'm thinking of a big strong stone pillar that's supporting you and these are things summarizing what we said before, is vitamin D I believe is crucial for MS and your diet, what you put in your body, and exercise. And then the final two things are support in. What does support in mean? The support that in comes into you, incoming support, your family, your friends, your support group. All those things are very important, the support that comes into you. And finally, the support that goes out. What do you do? I told you about the blue zone, where he went to five, four areas in the world, and these people were 90 years old, and he actually arm wrestled a 90 year old man in, in Italy and the man beat him because he was, he was strong, he was active. And so support out means doing stuff for other people and everybody has something to give. You might have a lot to give, but you have something to give. It might be encouraging somebody, just, just listen, listening to somebody. Sometimes people just want to talk, listen to them, give an ear. This final statement over here, the power of kindness, just being kind, compassionate, patient, those kind of things. 
I'll give you a quick final final one. Yeah, what do you tell you want to you want me to go? All right, final one I'm going to tell you about in terms of the power of patience where I learned. I was on a plane, and I'm sitting on a plane, and in the overhead compartment, somebody opens the overhead compartment and something falls on my head. What's my first response? I, 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 yeah, I want to get up and have a fight. But a cane falls on my head. It's a walking stick. So within seven seconds when I composed myself, I said, you know, somebody's got a walking stick here. I need to help them. And so I bent down and picked it up and gave it to them. I mean, that's what you need to do. We need to be a little bit patient. If you go to Publix and somebody's slow, I feel bad for them if they're slow. You know, so just think about that. Compassion, patience, kindness, all these things are virtues. Support out doing good. At the end of the day, you'll probably feel a lot better than support in. And, uh, well, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to, I've been, uh, I'm Paul, I'm done. Thank you. So earlier I was saying that we're going to hold off and wait until after the urologist speaks, but I forgot that we're separating the two doctors in the videos that we're doing these days. So we're going to do Q&A right now for Dr. Steingo. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand. I'm going to get around the room with the microphone, and you can ask your question into the mic, and he'll answer from up here. How's that? Who's up? You got food in your mouth. Um, my question is that you are saying that sugar is poison. I know that a lot of um, research has shown that diet soda is really bad and it causes um, MS-like symptoms. Have you heard that? So the question relates to sugar. I guess everybody could hear if you at the mic. Uh, sugar and diet soda. So firstly, I think there's no doubt absolutely that sugar is poison. Uh, diet soda is, to me, much healthier. If you're going to drink soda, the best drink is obviously, the most healthiest drink is just to drink water. Uh, and by the way, I think water is better than, than, than fruit juices as well, which have a lot of carbohydrates in them too. Uh, but I, I think there is some, there's, there's, there are theories and stories out there that if you have, you know, stuff like aspartame and, and NutraSweet and Equal and all those things that they might be bad for you, uh, I would say they're better than sugar. If you're going to drink, so if you're going to drink a soda, it's better in my mind to have, you know, a diet soda than anything else. And I have a friend who's an endocrinologist and... Um, says that she tells all her diabetics if they have to have a soda, you rather have a sweetened soda than sugar. So again, in moderation, if you have some once in a while, some sweetened drink, I don't think there's, I, I don't, I don't, and I've never read any good definite evidence. There's stuff on the internet that they tell you aspartame causes MS. Then it causes migraine. Then it causes this and then it causes that. There's no good solid scientific evidence for those things. So there's no, there's no, there's no scientific correlation that aspartame causes MS. There are people on the internet who will say that, but there's no scientific correlation for that. So in moderation. You said that you should have mostly vegetable and fruit diet. Does that mean like no fish, chicken, meat, turkey? So what, what I was saying is that, that your diet should be vegetable and plant-based. And if you were a vegetarian, then you would have no fish or anything else. You would just have vegetables and plants and no animal product. But if you don't want to do a strict vegetarian diet, yes, then it's OK to have fish. Just eat healthy fish. Uh, which is predominantly fish like salmon, cod, halibut, sardines, all the fatty, oily, dark type fish that have a good amount of omega-3 fatty acids. You want those kind of fish. Now, I just heard about somebody the other day that ate a lot of salmon and got mercury poisoning. So be careful where the source of, if you have a lot of that, be careful where the source, for example, of the salmon is. Make sure it comes from good sources. If you do have chicken and, uh, or turkey, then just make sure it's lean and that you don't fry it. Or if you do fry it, fry it in vegetable oil, healthy oil, and not, oh, yes, we're back in jail. Uh, healthy oil and, and, and uh, you know, not, not in animal fat. And you said to cut off the, uh, the salt. I did cut off the salt about 30, probably 30 years ago. I used to cook without salt. And uh, about three years ago, I, um, I was uh, diagnosed with um, hypothyroidism. So I figured that it was either the salt or probably I was under a lot of stress at the time. So could that be a reason uh, that I, because I was cooking without salt at all. And that's the, that's the way I raised basically my family. You know, I, I'm no uh, salt or electrolyte expert. So um, in terms of the hypothyroidism, you probably need to speak to the endocrinologist about that. But I say that what the studies have shown in the past year, now this has all come about in the past year with salt and MS is that they suspect that salt, we know for many years that salt
causes you to, if you have too much salt, you retain fluid. It can affect your blood pressure and, and your heart. And that's why people have said salt is bad, too much salt is bad. But what they've shown now is that if you have too much salt in your diet, it seems to promote inflammation in the body. And that's why they're suggesting to have less salt. Well, we'll, we'll get to you in a second, Tom. We just have to, we're going around. We'll bring you the mic in a second. Dr. Steinger, what's a good amount of vitamin D to take? I can't, so I can't give you the exact answer. What I can say to you is we can measure your vitamin D. So when you have lab work done, you get your vitamin D level checked. And when you know what your vitamin D level is, then we can tell you how much vitamin D to take. So people sometimes need big doses that we wouldn't have used in the past. We might have said, well, some people are taking 10,000 units a day. We might say, wow, that's a big amount. It's too much. Because we've said before, it's a fat-soluble vitamin. You can be toxic. But now that we can measure the level, we know that some people need large amounts of vitamin D. We want to saturate the receptors. Remember that. I'm your own um, uh, anti-inflammatory called mung beans. Mung, M-U-N-G. Mung? mung? I have not heard of that. Well, I was bringing some that are very inflammatory. I'm an mother. Like, I germinate them. It's a god. The day process. Yeah. And uh, I guess you could say your mind is the most strong thing. But I, I feel it works. They're mung beans. Okay. So he's, he's saying there's an anti-inflammatory mung, M-U-N-G. But if you go on the internet, you'll know you're going to find many, many different diets and recommendations and uh, literally probably a hundred different recommendations of diets and beans and uh, different berries and, and things to try. And, uh, you know, if, they're not, if there's no scientific evidence, I don't know that, that, that I want to be, a, you know, a guinea pig in any of these things. Uh, the things I've spoken to you about are things that are based on science and published studies. The vitamin D, the B12, the salt, those things are published studies. There are many other things that, are, that I'm not convinced about. Where's Stuart? He's, uh, we'll, we'll get there. Um, I was on your, uh, one of your slides, it has a definition by the MS Society as fatigue. And uh, the, what I noticed was the first word was subjective. And I was trying to understand that. Does it mean the body's not really feeling fatigue? It's a, it's a physiological or is it a... a Subje emotional? Yeah, no. Um, well, I mean, cause, it can cause emotional reactions. The question is subjective. Subjective, medically, when we use the word subjective, we mean it's what you feel. Every symptom you report is subjective. So if you say I'm fatigued, it's subjective. If you say I'm numb, it's subjective. Because I can't measure your fatigue. If you're numb, if you say my hand's numb, I can't, I can't tell if it's numb. I can't feel that it's numb. So anything that a person experiences is subjective. Anything that I can measure or someone else can measure is objective. So subjective numbness means you come in and you say, I have fatigue. So for example, if you're applying for disability and we write to the disability company, we say, you know, Mr. X has fatigue. Uh, this is, they say that's subjective. What proof do you have for it? Did you measure their muscle strength? And we have to find, say, this is not, we're not talking about muscle fatigue where someone gets weak. We're talking about fatigue exhaustion and it's subjective. And they say, how do you know it's there? Maybe they just want disability. Maybe they're, you know, making it up, you know, that, that kind of, so subjective is something you feel, that we can't actually, we can't actually measure that kind of fatigue. Now, if you say your leg fatigues, when I walk my leg fatigues, I can measure that, I can measure your strength, I can say walk for two minutes and measure you again, I say your leg fatigued 20% after you walked. That's a different kind of fatigue, that's muscle fatigue, motor fatigue, and we're talking about this fatigue of MS, this exhausting, overwhelming thing. That is subjective, we can measure that, but we know it exists. There's no good measure for it, though. You said that uh, vitamin D you wanted at least up to 75. What about B12? Is there a certain level that you want that up, up to also? Yeah, B12 has a range also in the same thing. We can measure B12 level in the, in the lab. And normally what they'll often tell you is the normal range of B12 is 200 to about 1100. That's what they quote oftentimes. And then they put a little sidebar and they say that in 5% in of people, you need to be above 400. So pretty much what I'm aiming for is over 400 in someone with MS, over 400. And if it comes back at 2,000, that's fine. It's not toxic, it's a water-soluble vitamin. So if it comes back at 2,000, unlike a high vitamin D, 2,000 vitamin B12 doesn't really matter. But we want it over 400. So again, the amount you need depends on your level. If your vitamin B level is 1,500, if your B12 is 1,500, uh, to be taking B12 shots is just absolutely a waste of time. People will do that, though, sometimes for energy. 
but over 400 will be what we want. We're just doing. Is there any more? Are we done? Any other questions? No more questions? What? We got one on the side. I'd run, but it would look ridiculous. I've been having a reaction to the Copaxin, so my doctor's switching me to Jelenia, and I was wondering, you explained how to Sabri with the arrow blocks and forms a barrier. How does Jelenia work? Yeah, Jelenia, I, I don't have it up anymore, but uh, Jelenia works at an earlier stage. So if you remember uh, over here on that particular slide that there were lymphocytes, we said in the immune system that are activated. So what Jelenia does is it sequesters them. It hides them, it locks them up. Jelenia keeps the lymphocytes uh, he's up here. Jelenia keeps the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. So what happens is in your body, lymphocytes are circulating. That's part of the immune system, part of the immune cells. The lymphocytes are the cells that actually attack the brain and the spinal cord. And what Jelenia does is that it prevents them from getting out of the lymph node. So most of them are kept in the lymph nodes. They're not killed. It doesn't kill them like chemotherapy drugs. It just keeps them locked up in the lymph nodes. So if they're not in the lymph nodes, they can't be out there doing their damage. We don't fully understand how it's working. Is that, the, is that the reason why it works? We don't know. But that's one action that it has. The lymphocytes are kept hidden. They're kept locked up in the lymph nodes. And if you stop taking the Jelenia, then they're able to escape and they get back into the circulation. But that's basically what it's doing. It's sequestering or locking up or hiding the lymphocytes in the lymph nodes. So Any other questions? Another question. I like that. Keep them coming around the room. It's good. It's good for cardio. What about in the case of Tecfidera? How would that work? Tecfidera? We don't fully understand how Tecfidera works. The only thing we know about it is that it works on one of the, on the, one of the oxidative pathways. So it works on a substance called NRF2 that you might or might not have read about. There's something called NRF2, which, was work, which is an antioxidative substance. And it seems that Tecfidera promotes, it's preventing some of the oxidative damage that's going on. It has a slight effect on the lymphocytes, much less than Jelenia we just talked about. But it's working on a pathway to reduce the oxidative damage to the cell. That's what it seems to be doing. That's one we probably understand less than most of the others. Yes, uh, Dr. Stango, when you said that uh, taking a vitamin D, you don't need to take any more antioxidants or uh, just a, uh, you could also take um, antioxidants. No, you can take antioxidants. I just think most people take too many antioxidants, but I think some antioxidants are fine. Uh, you know, just as, especially, uh, you know, I mean, if you go on the internet and look up antioxidants, there's a thousand different things you could take. And there's work going on now with turmeric, and things like that, I think those are fine. There's CoQ10, there's turmeric, there are things like that that I think are fine. I just said I don't think you need to take antioxidants in excess. And I think the, the other thing about it is uh, not only not in excess, but not too, you, you be careful what you take, that it's not some, something that promotes or stimulates the immune system. So if you take some antioxidants, I, I don't think I would object to that. Just look carefully at what they're what they meant to do. But you can take them, yes, you can take some antioxidants. And then the vitamin D, actually, if you don't have vitamin D, the antioxidants will be a waste of time, is what I'm saying. If you take vitamin antioxidants and your vitamin D level is low, they're not going to get into the cell. So the vitamin D helps them get into the cell. We're over on the south side. And Dr. Steinko, how, how much vitamin D did you say? And what did you talk about the Yeah, we um, just answered storage. that, uh, John, we just answered that a second ago. So vitamin D, we can measure your blood level. That's the way we can tell how much you need. We need to do a blood test. Once we do the blood test, we know what your level is, and then we can tell you how much it take. Anybody else? Do you have one more? He has one more, you have one more? We'll go there first. Um, I know you were talking about um, before with the, um, the, the anti, um, what were you talking about? The antioxidants. Anti yes. What about like if you take foods that are anti-inflammatory? Like I know turmeric and there's a couple of, will those actually have any effect on um, patients with MS or is it? Yeah. Superficial. I mean, I just mentioned turmeric now, but um, yeah, if you take something like turmeric, there is some evidence, there are studies and there's some suggestions that maybe these sub substances are helpful. Okay. So I have no objection to turmeric. 
uh, I think it will be fine. I can't, there's no big scientific study that says that you need to take this or that you can take it. For, uh, you for know, any, any, there's no study where they've done hundreds of thousands of people. There is some evidence that it might be good, and I think turmeric is one is, is not going to harm you in any way. So I think I wouldn't have no objection to you taking turmeric. Is that a generic, though, for any yes. anti-inflammatory? Um, just foods. I know there's different, you know, like um, foods that are out there that are anti-inflammatory. Yeah, I mean, I would say first do no harm. And turmeric, I don't think, does any harm. And some studies suggest that maybe it is good to take turmeric. It's got some good properties, so I think it'd be okay to take it. if you take, As long as you take a good product from some reliable, you know, vitamin store, I think that'd be fine. Is there any way to tell if Empire works, is working for me? Uh, yes, there is. A, I mean, there's, there's, an F, there's a way. Empiria is an FDA-approved drug. And when a drug is approved by the FDA, they always put guidelines for us. And the guideline for Empiria is that people taking Empiria have to be able to walk 25 feet in between 8 and 45 seconds. There's a walking time. And if someone can't walk, we, don't give, we should not give them Empiria because it's not approved for people who are not walking. If someone's not walking, it's not going to make them walk. But if someone is walking and able to walk 25 feet between 8 and 45 seconds, then they take Empira. Then they should improve. Uh, the FDA guideline typically is that they should improve by at least 20%. That's what they say. That's what they want. People don't always improve 20%. Sometimes somebody might come back and they might improve slightly, but they might feel better in other ways. Uh, but the FDA doesn't want to know about that, and the insurance companies don't want to know about that. The measurement they use is walking speed. And sometimes it helps with other things too. But theoretically, the way we measure is by the walking speed. Okay. All right. So that will, I want to thank Dr. Steingo for coming down tonight.